Are you sitting there right now using a PC with an overpriced operating system while you eat unhealthy ramen? Well, I apparently have all of the solutions to your life. Go to Vite Ramen right now and get their healthy protein-filled ramen for 10% off with offer code BROKENSILICON. And then go to cdkeyoffer.com to get 25% off all Windows keys and use Die Shrink to get 3% off everything else on the website. And we'll talk about these sponsors more later. But for now, let's just get on with the show. And welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Bugging Out I, Tom. <laughs> Today, I am joined by co-host... Uh, not s- stable eye, Dan? I don't know if that's accurate, but... What's not stable about your eyes? I need to wear contacts? I don't know. I might no, have Dan, like I scratched my eye last night at some point. I don't know that's when the- I did it, but... I usually like pull out my laptop and just like read a couple articles before I go to sleep and like the light. And then this morning I had sensitivity to light. It's getting there. But, you know, if anyone's I've scratched my eye before it, it's a, it's a fun experience. It just slowly gets better and heals over a day or two. And your eye just randomly starts watering up. So I am not crying about seeing more pictures of lunar lake and how beautiful it is uh it's just if you see a tear come down or my eye looks a little red i don't know how i didn't know how the other time it happened in my life but i guess i scratched my eye and it is feels a lot better now than this morning but it is still an annoyance for sure and to be fair we have uh, already shed our fair bit of tears over how beautiful Lunar Lake is. So. That's right. I mean, we I'm all cried spent, out on that. We, yeah, we spent a whole hour crying. That, well, that was my point. It's not that I wouldn't cry about seeing Lunar Lake. It's that I've already cried for multiple hours, and so it's out of my system. Yeah, because it is beautiful. Of course. Techno writes in, and he says, what would have happened, what would have to happen for Tom to create a politics channel? Uh, I would have to clone myself because I did have one between 2019 and 2021. It was called Flyover States. They're still up on the Moore's Law is Dead. I don't know if they're really up anywhere else right now, but they are at least still up on the Moore's Law is Dead Patreon. And you can just search for the collection there. I think there's like eight or nine episodes or something like that. And Also, I mean, the problem with uh, politics channels is when you look at them, it's like, they weirdly seem to just slowly grow over time. And by the time you're five years in, there's like a dozen people in the, the recording room for some reason. At least that's what I've noticed on, on the ones that I've like seen. 538 or what? F- uh, oh, like 538. I mean, I guess if I guess a few other channels like this isn't a politics channel, I suppose. But like if you, anybody watches H3 ever there crew seems to keep slowly expanding like i go months sometimes without ever watching yeah. anything by them and then i click and it's like oh i guess there's just four more there's people this, there's this woman here this guy there in a hot tub for some reason um but yeah no i mean i had one and it was basically there were a couple interviews but like opinion and just kind of similar stuff to what i would do for moore's law is dead but by 2021 i just decided like there was like one every month for a while, then every two months and every quarter, then one, just only, I think two or three in 2021. And I'm like, I don't have time to do this and videos and the podcast. And frankly, I'm just disgusted by what's happening to politics lately. And so it's like, well, that just raises the stakes higher. So I would be even more pressured or I'd pressure myself more to not make mistakes and to put all my energy into it. I cannot afford to do that. I just think... The comment sections, the comment sections uh, on tech stuff can be a nightmare. But, ooh, look at any political channel. Uh, it's just half of pe- half of the comments are just saying, "I think you need to die" or something like that. So, eh, I just don't see the op- the benefit, the cost benefit analysis in doing that anymore. And I don't have the energy to unless I did. Like, had a whole team of people fact checking things and me thinking about like. It's just, there's just not time for it. Could something like that happen again or something closer to that? Yes, someday, but the team would have to be bigger. There's just no time for it right now. I barely have time to do this, frankly. 
Yeah. No, the cost benefit analysis of a politics channel. What about the po- cost benefit analysis of Tom's w- beard that he has now? <laughs> the, but you, my mustache, you mean? Not beard. Yes, I have the beard. You have the mustache. <laughs> Look at me. I have the mustache now. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let us know below what the what everyone thinks about the mustache. But I, this has happened before. I'm just shaving, and I'm like, eh, I could have a mustache for a week. That might be funny. There, there was one day I uh, I did that at work, and I thought just thought it was funny because I don't really grow a very thick mustache, and people were like. I don't know if they were making fun of me or if they were being serious or they're like, the mustache works. And I was like, I don't think it does at all. And I shaved the next day. I thought it looked hilarious, which is why I did it. But My, my girlfriend, Emma, thinks it works great. And I yeah. think, I don't know. <laughs> I just think it's a fun thing to do every now and then. And having, having goofy facial hair is fun every once in a while. I had absolutely. A, I had a high school teacher that after no shave November would for the next week would just shave his beard down into weirder and weirder shapes. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have find ways to have fun, you know, yeah. and that's just one of them. Um, but speaking of not having fun, let's get into some corrections here. Oh Jensen Wang, great leader and CEO says cell PlayStation cell processor was consigned by Toshiba because the plan, they plan to use it in high end TVs. I'm sure he's referencing how, and one of the, what, it comes up every now and then. One of the recent pieces of content, I was like, it really just seemed like a complete waste of time. He says, and IBM thought that they could also use it in servers. Why would you want it in a TV? I don't know, but it might have, might have had out of order, but instead they went with six SPEs to eight because eight is beautiful. Ken Kudaragia. Oh yeah, he did say eight is beautiful. Um, so I this was, you know, contributor part of the team, Carbon Cry, just wrote a full response to it. No offense, Jensen Wang, but... You, Carbon you have a lot you, of money, Jensen. So. He says, Carbon Cry says you're wrong about this. He says, first of all, with Toshiba, they found the cell processor useful because it was great at decoding, which is a real problem for TVs at the time. Remember, this was mm. decades ago. He said cell gave them the cost advantage from scale production. And so that was a success from their perspective that they could have it in a console and put it in TVs at the same time. Meanwhile, with IBM, they saw it as something to be used for supercomputers, which I guess it did go into some supercomputers. <clears throat> and it was the first supercomputer to break the paraflops per second. Uh, mar- what is it? Uh, bar. So they also saw it as a success. Now, out of order was not dismissed arbitrarily, but because no one involved wanted it. Toshiba wanted a decoder, and you only code a codec one. IBM wanted an accelerator card for supercomputers. Again, in order is not a problem. And Sony wanted a vertex shader. And that is what SPEs were meant to be, a super powerful and flexible vertex shader pipeline that does not need out of order. The problem is, though, Sony's pixel shader coprocessor project failed. That was supposed to be paired with this. And so they just basically had to put a full graphics card next to it. And all of a sudden, half of the benefits of the SPEs had no natural workload to boost them. So (laughs) it does kind of seem like a situation where there were like three people or entities came together, Toshiba, IBM, Sony. They all had their uses for it. And it actually worked for Toshiba and IBM. But for Sony, half of what was going to be paired with it didn't work out. And so they ended up with this ridiculous supercomputer processor that needed a graphics card anyways. So I think that was interesting. And that super, uh, I think, I can't remember if we, this was on another episode that we just recorded, but the, with the cell, or maybe it was something I just saw online, uh, people talking about the cell. It, it led to some fun debates when you were a kid because people that liked Sony were like, it has a supercomputer processor in it. <laughs> but, yeah. And then other people, uh, you know, it wasn't really until later in the generation that people, like, because people were less online back then and less like, oh, you know, well, the devs say it's this, this, this. My memory was, it was basically the Sony fanboys would just say it's a supercomputer and then the Xbox fanboys would just say, yeah, but it's too expensive and stupid. And there was later in the generation or at least halfway through where it was like, oh, this seems really hard to program for, Sony. And then they were like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's almost like just... For for fun, chain, completely changing how you uh, do game design might be complicated. And then half of the point of that failing <laughs> <Not> <laughs> makes it stupid. Like, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and that's where I continue to go. I don't know that the cell processor was bad. I just think what Sony put together didn't really make sense is really how I would put it with the PS3. Well, I mean, I love my PS3. It was a great generation in my opinion, but... Yeah, there were some questionable design choices uh, on Sony's Again, this is in spite of it. It's like, 
if they would have just had a more logical CPU, if they would have just not like the <clears throat> five SD card readers, this weird, you feel like they could have just made that like a four fifty dollar console that was basically the same thing. Probably launched sooner because it wouldn't have had as many issues that delayed it as well. well and, and, and again, they, it's like in spite of those mistakes, it was still great. And then they famously almost launched it with that boomerang controller, which I think might have killed the console. If they, I mean, that would have been just yeah, dumber than what was it, the Duke. The original <laughs> Xbox. That looked terrible. Um, all right. Well, let us move on from this discussion, though, to the first story for today. Uh, duh, 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 story number one. This week in Fabs, Intel Foundry Services reports horrific losses and TMC quakes in its boots. CNBC, quoting from them, Intel said its Foundry business recorded an operating loss of $7 billion in 2023 on sales of $18.9 billion. That's a wider loss than the $5.2 billion Intel reported in its Foundry business in 2022 on $27.5 billion in sales. This is the first time that Intel has disclosed revenue totals for its Foundry business alone. So IFS seems like a money pit on fire. Their 10 nanometer node, currently responsible for almost all of their production, has been leaked time and time again to be very expensive to produce. Even based on what we know of the base technology, it makes sense for it to be very expensive. This has been said for a very long time, in other words, and the fact that basically they're just making everything on 10 nanometer now, and it's an incredibly inefficient node, cannot be helping this situation. And last, if we look at Intel's and AMD's margins and average selling prices and then at TSMC's margins, we see that somehow it seems like AMD gets similar or better margins than Intel. Well, TSMC is itself making a separate profit off of making AMD chips. That's how inefficient Intel Foundry services are. So that was big news. We decided to combine it with a couple other stories, though, because also there was, of course, an earthquake in Taiwan. And the way I'm going to cover how serious the earthquake was with regards to semiconductors is just quoting UMC and TSMC, two different you know companies. Yeah. So UMC says, the recent 7.2 magnitude earthquake recorded off the coast of Huaylin, Taiwan, in the early hours of April 3rd had no material impact on UMC's operations. Some wafers in the production line were effective. Currently, operations and wafer shipments are resuming as normal, and there will be no meaningful impact on UMC's finances and business. TSMC says... Recovery of our fabs reached more than 70% within 10 hours of the earthquake, with new fabs such as the Fab 18 facility reaching more than 80% in that amount of time as well. A small number of tools were damaged at certain facilities, partially impacting the operations. However, there is no damage to our critical tools, including all of our EUV lithography tools. Meanwhile, the tragic earthquake on Taiwan caused some panic in the semiconductor and investor circles with fear of disruption to critical TSMC and UMC fabs. However, earthquakes are fairly common in this area, and the foundries are well prepared for them. UMC announced almost no disruption hours after. And TSMC says that they are almost at 100% capacity already. So I thought that was important to cover because undoubtedly some people were worried about that type of stuff. I think me and you have been wondering when some natural disaster is going to happen there again as well, right? Yeah, I, I mean, based on what I've seen so far, it seems like the entire country is faring pretty well, like as well as you can on a huge earthquake hits, like from what I had read. Obviously, yeah, a lot of people pointed out that this is kind of a demonstration in that, wow, has architecture and safety standards come like this is like way worse than I think a earthquake some time ago. And yet there's compared to the last time, almost no deaths. There are deaths, but compared to the last time. Yeah, it's I not mean, even it's a not fraction. Like, it's like a micro fraction of what it's happened. Not like, last time. Yeah, it's not like what happened. And it happens uh, sometimes with earthquakes where like thousands of people die. I believe the number is still under a dozen, which. Obviously, it's bad that anyone died, but that's uh, the country seems to still be functional, which a 7.2 earthquake on a, an island nation can be really bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's good that they're back up and running uh, for the most part. And I guess it's good for the rest of the world that this didn't knock out Taiwan uh, for more than a few hours, it seems like. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I don't know that I have much else to say about that. Right now, the planned next guest is Asianometry, who lives in oh. Taiwan and was there for it. So we'll be right. talking about TSMC, Chinese fabs, and the uh, the results of that. So that'll be a, a real, we'll be fortunate to be able to speak with him about that. So I don't know how much more I have to say about that, but unless you do, Dan, but I mean, what did well, you think about Intel's? I just Intel's? hope Asianometry is doing well despite that. But I obviously, asked, he, he said on, he's so. totally fine. It was a scary earthquake, but he said he nothing happened to him. It just and then was bad. We have to remember an equally devastating earthquake happened in New Jersey and slash New York this week where a strong gust of wind seemed to hit the entire city. <laughs> 
Like some people didn't even realize it was an earthquake, apparently. Yeah. Um, but no, we can move on to Intel now. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts about the reporting here. It's not all that surprising, but it is kind of worse than I expected, as usual, with Intel. Yeah. I mean, I was, I, I, we said that on the, I think the newest broke, or not broken silicon, die shrink where, uh, I was hopeful that maybe something would turn out well with this, but uh, unsurprisingly, it didn't. So, I mean, all I can say is hopefully that this isn't a the start of a trend and uh, it, within two quarters or something, this their uh, foundry business starts turning around. Mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, and, and it's funny. That's been, What I've heard is interesting is that like Intel 4 and 3 probably cost more or could cost more than 10 nanometer but generally speaking some people i talk to at ifs don't really think their new nodes coming out that are competing with tsmc's five nanometer and four nanometer products really even cost much more to make than 10 nanometer which is why they're Hmm. desperate to switch to that as fast as possible because 10 nanometer is just so woefully inefficient um but you know i mean outside of that i just I, I still have to wonder, though, if they will even really be competitive with where AMD and TSMC are at that point by then. And that road to get there is going to be a hard one because they're still planning yeah. to use Raptor Lake for like most of their stuff for like another year. Like a year from now, early 2025 is when they're, man, will they be trying to switch over as fast as possible. But that's just another year of just not making money on all the stuff they're selling. Yeah, I... I mean, I don't know how Intel continues to fare. Obviously, they got some cash flow from, or I guess I don't know how much, how the grant system works with the U.S. government with uh, technology, but they have some grant money from the U.S. right now. So hopefully that injects some cash. But But from what I've heard, they basically haven't gotten cash. Like that was something that I haven't put into a video yet that I've heard is like, one person was telling me, as far as they're aware, though, Intel really hasn't gotten a check yet. <laughs> well, yeah, because the way grants... promise they don't get it, though. Yeah, because the way grants work isn't just the government says you have a grant and then they give you all the money. And then all of a sudden, just $50 billion shows up or somewhere, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's usually strings attached to it, and uh, it usually doesn't all come at once. I, don't, I shouldn't say usually. Well, I, I'm not going to say it never does because I don't know every grant, but it usually doesn't come all at once as far as I know. But that's the thing, too, is like the U.S. government funding Intel, what they want to see funding is new fabs in Ohio and Arizona. They Mm want to see new U.S. jobs. That's why they're giving them the money. They don't want to get this feeling that like Intel is getting money to bail themselves out to make more stuff that won't make money without even employing people yet. So I don't see the CHIPS Act really saving them. You know, it will help them in a few years once they get that. Well, every but. They still, are, they're just going to still have to find a way to, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in uh, later in the episode when we get to the Zen 5 stuff, but like, if there was ever a time for AMD to try a price war, it is with Zen 5. If they are smart, they <laughs> will not be stingy. I'm just saying it. They will not be. Like, keep the prices at Zen 4 or slightly lower for certain tiers. You put that 16 core out that's like 20% better than what they have now, or more depending on, I guess, the application. And you're going to have something if you sold it for 600 bucks or something that Intel can't compete with. And if they lower prices, they're already losing money. I mean, this is it, AMD. This is your chance. Yeah, I I mean, what they're doing right now is, yeah, I mean, if they just pushed it a little further than what they were doing right now, it would be a price war. Because I I already think with the uh, X3D uh, chips that they're selling, that that's close to a pr- uh, price war that they're going for because you can see the i7s dropping in price like every week. Yeah, because for like ninety percent of people, I feel like, or I shouldn't say that ninety percent of people like in the that like listen to this type of podcast would be the, the, the X3D chips just make the most sense to buy. Like, mm-hmm. not even necessarily the seventy eight hundred X3D, but if you're a gamer, uh, if you're not going to get the seventy eight hundred X3D, I would probably say get like the fifty eight hundred or fit. Yeah, 5800 5, X3D. X3D. Well, yeah, there are other ones now. Yeah, I, guess, I can't but. remember all of the X3D CPUs that are out now. So, mm-hmm. But that's what I think I would recommend. Mm-hmm. All right. Grand Demand writes in, and he says, will the earthquake in Taiwan affect TSMC's wafer pricing? Do you expect increased prices or a lack of sales to show up for PC components in the short term? Short term, absolutely not. Uh, anything that we're going to buy in the short term in the United States, assuming that's where you are, Grand Demand, they're here. 
it's on the boat already. So that's yeah, completely I mean, unaffected. In the mid turn, maybe somewhat, but I don't see how this affects anything long term or super short term. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take time to know like how fast they bounce back. Obviously, this just happened. TSMC and UMC want you want to inspire True. confidence by telling us and. Maybe it will become evident in a couple of weeks that, that there are more problems than they're letting on. I'm not saying that will happen, but maybe. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I think the Baltimore bridge has more likelihood of impacting pricing yeah. on stuff than this. <laughs> yeah, I agree. As it stands right now. I mean, I think like they're losing dozens of millions of dollars every day right now due to the that bridge collapse. Mm-hmm. Patrick Grioni writes in and says, hello, do you think it's possible that AMD will switch from TSMC to Intel fabs in the future? I think it is potentially a logical move if Intel becomes competitive over time as the investments in it is allocating to fab seems to demonstrate. Well, my answer is, what's your timeline? Uh, because here's some, a way I would put it. In the distant future, anything is possible. 20 years ago, in 2004, Dan, do you think me and you would have expected that Radeon would be part of AMD, not its own company, uh, or ATI, uh, and that AMD would not only be in the same company as ATI, but that they would be dominating Intel in design while TSMC beats Intel and Foundries, and NVIDIA becomes an AI company. All of these companies are now different companies. So 20 years from now, I don't know what's possible, maybe, but anytime soon, hell no. AMD and TSMC are best buds. They're giving AMD the best prices and the best and most reliable nodes. And AMD doesn't want Intel to steal their secrets. And everything we're seeing from IFS is if AMD goes to Intel, they're going to have to pay more for less. So, no, and, and, there's and no just, way AMD, no. Th- things can change even over a shorter period. Like, it's, well, people probably don't forget it now because it's so famous. But, like, 12 years ago, AMD's stock was worth $2.40. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot can change in 12 years. Maybe Intel will be very much resurgent in 10, 5, 10, 12 years. Like, that's completely believable. Uh, I mean, maybe it's only five. But yeah, I I don't see it within the next, like, I don't know, two or three generations AMD moving off of it TSMC. No, I I, for the the, most of their stuff, at least. No, I don't. I mean, because like Intel would have to be a non-threat at that point so that AMD doesn't worry about them stealing their secrets. But then also IFS would have to outpace TSMC simultaneously while AMD needs the extra capacity and TSMC can't give it to them. I I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, Magnus writes in, he says, Hi, Tom. Does TSMC have similar technology to that of Intel's upcoming PowerVIA? Quoting Carbon Cry's answer. PowerV is just a brand name for Intel's implementation of backside power delivery. TSMC is planning to add BPT, BPD to second generation two nanometer nodes. There are some differences. TSMC is starting with more conservative implementation, but everyone will offer BPD because they must to continue to scale. So yeah, I, I and I do see questions like this every now and then where it's like, is TSMC going to have this one tech in chiplets or nodes or thing that Intel's doing. And they kind of all seem to announce very similar things with different names back and forth all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's a thing like when you're outside of an industry and not not that I'm, but like now that like I've been in like been in fields uh, that you have uh, analogous stuff like, everybody's always working on the same technology. There's no, it's pretty rare that there's like a complete breakthrough that nobody could have thought of (laughs) Mm -hmm. coming. Um, All right. Let me move on to the second story then here with story number two. Qualcomm Snapdragon X Elite is capable of running Baldur's Gate 3 at 30 frames per second. I just decided to title that. Where's our poppers, Tom? What? Where's our like New Year's Eve poppers? Oh yeah, I know. We should really be <laughs> celebrating this. Thirty frames per second in 1080p. But that is what the title the, of the article I start with here from TechSpot was. I thought it'd be funny just to use that title. So, quoting from TechSpot, Qualcomm recently said its upcoming ARM SoC would provide a good gaming experience for low power laptops, and it showed it off at GDC and promoted it with several YouTube channels and online personalities. The Snapdragon and X Elite laptop prototypes can be found running modern games like Baldur's Gate 3 in real time. And according to Snapdragon Insider, Devin Arthur, Baldur's Gate 3 was running at 1080p and 30 frames per second, which, in his opinion, is a perfectly pay- playable frame rate. Uh-huh. So 
Is that impressive at all, though? Qualcomm announced the X Elite well before it would be launching, positioning it against Phoenix and Laptop Raptor Lake R. And so far, all of these public benchmarks seem to be pretty much just allowing journalists to walk up to a prototype and press the go button for what, therefore, then is really just a curated canned benchmark. These aren't real time. If all you do is walk up to a thing, you couldn't touch ahead of time and press start, in my opinion. Um, and for the record, well, we don't know the exact settings that Qualcomm used in Baldur's Gate 3. GPU testing of this game at Gamers Nexus showed cards like the A380 and RX 580 performing better than that with ultra settings in 1080p. And ancient gameplays found that the 580 and 780M, integrated graphics in Phoenix, mm -hmm. often trade blows in performance. I mean, the 580, I think, on average is usually strong, but there's a decent amount of games where the 780M wins. And he also ran Baldur's Gate 3 around 60 frames per second on integrated Phoenix graphics as well. Now, it was low in 1080p, but, I mean, look, we have similar performing cards at Gamers Nexus running above 30 frames per second on Ultra and 1080p. We have in low settings, it's running at 60 with Phoenix integrated graphics. And all we know is, without knowing the settings, Qualcomm's running at 30. So, I don't know. It seems like the X Elite isn't notably stronger than Phoenix, if stronger at all, when it comes to graphical performance. And also, well, they tend to say that the big weakness in Windows gaming with the Snapdragon X Elite is its CPU. I looked at Baldur's Gate 3 benchmarks that showed even a Haswell quad core can run the game over 40 frames per second. Mm. And Zen Plus seems to do 60 just fine in this game. So, Look, of course, the X Elite is not going to launch against Phoenix 2. It's going to go against Strix, so we're not even comparing it against the right thing, and it doesn't even seem to beat it. AI and efficiency seem like the areas this product may be able to brag about, but that's it. And we'll need third-party reviews to confirm that, not can benchmarks. So far, gaming seems very uninspiring, in my opinion, and well below the impressiveness level that they are trying to make it out to be. So, yeah, that was my reporting on it. Obviously, we're just basically talking about graphics performance, but I'm not the one doing it. Qualcomm's the one saying this will be a decent laptop gaming APU, and I am not seeing the evidence. Yeah, I, I mean, from what I can tell, they're really trying to push the uh, AI angle, which I just don't know how useful AI is so far for the majority of people on Windows. Obviously, Microsoft is trying to push it as a feature, so within a couple of years, maybe this will I be more so, of a thing a to talk years. about. But then having great AI performance before you need it doesn't really matter. Uh, if mm -hmm. it even if it outcompetes like uh, Strix, which I don't remember if they said it will or not, but well, they don't know if it will. All okay. we know is that Strix is going to probably be in the same ballpark of tops performance. So I mean, you have a CPU that seems to be decent at benchmarks and that at first non-real applications, and I guess you can argue it is playable. Baldur's Gate 3 is playable at 1080p, which I don't think advertising 30 frames per second in the year 2024 is anything to write home about. I'm not say, going to say it's a complete deal breaker if you're mainly buying this for like work and it's really good for like office tasks. Sure, mm -hmm. then maybe it will be good. But the Elite X seems like it's, at least when it comes to performance, like a generation and a half behind almost uh Depending on what like you're looking at, maybe even more point, than that. It's on point for AI performance. In some CPU tasks, it might be competitive. But in Windows gaming, which again, Qualcomm's the one saying this is good at Windows gaming, not us. It, yeah, seems like when it comes out, it's going to be at least a full gen behind, I would argue. It seems like it to me. Yeah, and that's not to say like Qualcomm's completely out. Maybe this is the, their first iteration that... If we're being honest, however, it turns out maybe they shouldn't have just this should have just been a prototype that they iterate on, and that then like a year from now they release something better. But I don't know. Maybe the Snap Elite Dragon Elite X Two. I don't know what they would call it. Will catch X -Men up. X Men Two. Yeah, X Men yeah. Two. Maybe it will catch up a lot. But I, I don't think there's any reason to think this will be good. Yeah. Even if every article about it is, we want more of this. <laughs> Yeah, more 30 frames. Uh, yeah. Jensen Wang, great leader CEO, writes in again and says, isn't Qualcomm's X Elite launching mid-2024? If so, wow, it's so strong to beat Phoenix from early 2023. That's absolutely right. I mean, from what I, I think I remember, it's coming out in like June or something. So it's launching maybe a couple months before Strix, at best half a year before Strix, depending on exactly when it's easy to get. But it could be less than a quarter. So I, I, I don't, I, I'm just, a lot of people write in, 
it's not like we ever get like 10 comments at once, but I will say most pieces of content in the past couple of weeks, I've seen at least a couple of comments say, what do you think about the Snapdragon X Elite? This is what we think. There is no evidence this thing is going to be competitive with next-gen products, which it will have to compete with next-gen products. It's not out yet. And in their own canned benchmarks, like, it seems pretty easy to point out that it's losing half the time. So yeah. I, I'm not seeing the magic here. And I, I don't know. More competitors would be great. And I hope it has a niche. And it is decent because that can, again, only help. But I'm not seeing a, more competitors only helps if they add more competition. If all they do is make the existing people yeah. look good, they're not helping. You know, so I'm a little worried that's what we could see here. Yeah, I mean, because at least they seem to be claiming efficiency to some degree. So maybe it will be a really efficient laptop. And I- in some metrics, it seems like it could be like, what was the uh, comparison I saw someone say? I, I forgot which SOC it was, but they were like, yeah, it looks like it could be like twice as efficient as like the Steam Deck or something. And like something like at certain tasks, the Steam Deck excels at. So yeah, it seems like there may be some scenarios where it's like really good, but that's where it's going to excel from what I can tell already, people. If it excels, it's because it has a longer battery life and it can do AI stuff well, but you are taking a hit in performance, it seems like. Yeah, so maybe maybe it has a niche, but it's not gonna be it's not gonna be in every single uh, like class of laptop or something. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. All Jesse wants is for Maurice to play with her more often, but unfortunately, he just does not give out playtime or kisses for as low of a rate as she does, and I think she's just going to have to deal with that. But do you know what you don't have to deal with? Paying too much for Microsoft software if you go to cdkeyoffer.com. This piece of content is sponsored by cdkeyoffer.com. Whether it's Microsoft operating systems, office products, or even many of the latest games, cdkeyoffer.com provides PC gamers with a product this community deserves. Amongst endlessly elevating component costs, fair pricing on Microsoft keys is one thing that we at least should get, I think. And you know, the Moore's Law is Dead team has been working with cdkeyoffer.com for a very long time. And that's because they're good to me, good to Dan, good to about a dozen family members of friends of mine that have used their services. And they've been really, really good, most importantly, to the Moore's Law is Dead community. So support this channel by using offer code broken silicon to save 25% off Microsoft software or you can also use die shrink to save 3% off everything else on the website like games using either of those codes really helps the channel a ton and it helps save you money. So use those codes broken silicon and die shrink at cdkeyoffer.com today. Story number 3. Moore's Law said reconfirmed Zen 5 IPC projections. Last year, I leaked a roadmap that directly suggested that while AMD was hoping to achieve a higher than 15% IPC increase with Zen 5, at the time back then, they were only confident in obtaining about a 10 to 15% uplift over Zen 4. Generally speaking, the consensus among AMD sources, who provided a now widely verified core architecture overview, was that people should expect a 14 to 26% claimed IPC uplift over Zen 5, uh, for Zen 5 over Zen 4, so likely above average for a new generation, but not the insanity that the usual suspects tend to hype up, just like they lied about having proof of RDNA 3 and Lovelace being two to four times stronger than Amphere before entirely capitulating that they had no idea what they were talking about. And so, has anything changed? Not really. AMD are reportedly telling partners to expect Zen 5 to achieve an IPC increase of around 17%. You know, another source told me that it was like, uh, like mid teens, or I think I think it was like teens to mid to low twenties, depending on how much they try to goose the numbers. But that also that the chosen IPC claim depends on what marketing thinks they can get away with. Meanwhile, the sentiment that anything close to a forty percent IPC uplift is seemingly pure fantasy, which it must be noted. This channel has been saying consistently for about a year seems to still be holding true. Meanwhile, shipping manifests, including Zen Five engineering samples from laptop sticks to Ryzen packages, were leaked on Twitter by Harukaza Huruk A's five seven one nine. Hope that's said right. And Momo Mo US. Much easier to say name. This is just as expected for a full launch of these parts in quarter three. So while nothing overall is changing in terms of this channel's expectations for Zen Five, I would suggest that there is more optimism behind Zen Five uh, this month versus what 
I leaked a month ago when I confirmed exclusively that Zen 5 was launching in the second half of this year. It seems like it is going to get a, re a respectable performance increase. It's not going to be at the lowest end of expectations, I don't think. And it also does seem like it might be ready in quarter three, not you know, like late quarter four or something else goes wrong. And a final note for the story, unfortunately, one of the sources used in the video turned out to be a troll, prompting some online drama. A slide provided by this false source was originally in the video, but has now been removed. Well, regrettable, it is important to point out that any serious journalist would not act based on one source, and I'm no different. So corroboration and verification are the name of the game here, and the info presented in the video came from several sources, many of them extremely reliable and very thoroughly vetted people. Some of them were the same ones that provided that Zen 5 and Zen 6 <laughs> leak last year that is entirely in line with everything stated now. Incredibly, even the fake slide was corroborated as likely genuine by those long-term sources. Otherwise, who would not have been published. So I guess the trolls used info from prior leaks, especially a similar slide leaked last year by this channel exclusively, and the technical docs released by AMD in the run-up to Zen 5's launch. Hence, they managed to make a slide consistent with what Zen 5 actually is, enough to fool even sources at AMD itself. Oh, well. I do apologize for letting one bad, but basically a correct piece of data caused drama around a piece of reporting for me. I am sorry, but... I stand by what remains in that piece nonetheless, because about five other sources, including ones that have now widely verified slides that I leaked last year, verified the same information. And frankly, it seems like some people basically fed to me my own info, which, of course, didn't differ from what anyone else said. All right. What do you think, Dan? Uh, I mean, as far as the like new news goes, I mean, the shipping manifest that all of that seemed to be the most optimistic, it seems like. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's coming. The it's coming on time. There doesn't seem to be a delay, which is the new on time. Although I guess I yeah. don't know if they ever technically confirm quarter one, so they can argue there's never been a delay. Yeah, and uh, I, yeah, I, I, I suppose that's right. But quarter three is usually when they release CPUs, anyways, or qu quarter three, early quarter four, I guess, is usually when they release new CPUs. And uh, it seems like a, it's another iteration on what Zen Five uh, did. Or Zen four. Mm -hmm. We're we're starting to get to enough Zen architectures that I forget which one we're currently on sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um QH Freddy writes in and he says, I don't think it's a stretch to assume that AMD knows what architecture they will need a new socket for. Why do you think they are being muddy as far as their communication on this matter? Zen five and six are already on roadmaps. Does it cost them that much extra to say New platform on a roadmap, perhaps next to the one of them, rather than just keeping everything up in the air. So my uh, answer to this is, I actually don't think it's that simple. Th there's interviews out there with people at AMD where they talked about taking a lot of work to get Zen 3 working on AM4 perfectly. And they said it would have been much easier to just create a new package for like, I, I'm not using the wrong terminology, like the tracing inside, like to make Zen three's architecture work with the pin layout and all like fit in the package it would have been easier to just make a new one like intel does every two generations or something so i don't know that it's as simple like i i think amd may genuinely not know yet if it's worth the effort for like zen 7 from what i hear zen 6 should be on the same socket as zen 5 but they aren't sure what comes after that and yeah so without revealing stuff i'm putting together for like let's say, a future Zen architecture leak, they may have a lot, a lot of options and variations in what they release in upcoming architectures. And with that in mind, maybe they don't really know quite yet. It, it, you know, coming after Zen 6, that would put it three years from now or something. So there's still enough time here where they might not know how many iterations of a future architecture they're going to have. And until they have that in stone and then try to go to like the final hard designs, they might not know if it's going to use AM5 yet. So I can, I honestly do believe they're not sure yet if at least like a Zen 7 or later will be on AM5. Having said that, if they're sure Zen 6 will be, I, I don't know if you agree with me, should it, should they announce it will be? I, I mean, I think it buys a lot more confidence if they do, because as it is right now, it still, it still feels like there's a chance that Zen 5 might be the, could be the last one that uh, is, is on AM5. And well, then they're not doing any better than Intel at that point. And if they don't get, I, I kind of think to 
keep the platform longevity reputation they have. Mm -hmm. Zen 6 needs to be on it. I don't think Zen 7 does, but it would be better if Zen 7 uh, was on AM5. Yeah, um, I I think, I'm trying to remember my own leaks here. I think it was, like, there's two versions, and I think someone else said this on Twitter, too. I think there's two versions of, like, Zen 6 server. Like, one of them uses DDR6 and a new socket. And then the old, a smaller core count one may still use the existing Epic socket with DDR5. And then the consumer versions are planning to use DDR5. So you can see how Zen 6, maybe it was up for debate a little bit. But if there's going to be versions of Epic that use Zen 6 with DDR5, then that, that without a source, that would just tell you that alone probably means it's going to be on there. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if they just don't think it's worth announcing yet, or maybe they're saving it for like walking out on Computex, showing off Zen 5, showing a roadmap, and then on the roadmap it says Zen 6 also on AM5. It's like a, <clears throat> now we're 100% sure. So just so you know, if you buy Zen 5, you can upgrade to Zen 6. That, that I'm suspecting they they may confirm it at the Zen 5 mm-hmm. launch event, right? Okay, or I'm, unveiling, not launch event. Yeah, I, I mean, hopefully they do. That would be a good time to confirm it, I guess. <laughs> Maybe they just don't see a point in talking about it right now. Like, no, don't worry. Just buy Zen 4, please. <laughs> you know, it's their mentality. It, yeah, I, and I guess I really don't know uh, as like a... Because they've already for, confirmed for, Zen 5s on AM5, I believe, even though we can all guess it would have been. I think they have literally said it, so maybe that's why. I mean, they're yeah, like, I, I you think don't need it, to know yet. I, I don't know how much purchasing that would inspire if people saw that. Uh, like, on the margins, there might be some people that decide to go in on Zen 4 if they see that it will be, that the AM5 will support Zen 6 as well. But mm-hmm. you know, maybe it really doesn't do that much. <laughs> Um, Mo writes in and says, will AM5 ever support more than two RAM sticks at the same time at reasonable speeds? There's a lot of issues trying to get 128 gigabyte plus RAM working on AM5. Um, all I can say is it sounds like it does it much easier with Zen 5, but I don't really have a direct quote yet, Mm -hmm. you know, on that. So without me being able to give you, because my answer is, Kind of a soft yes, but unless I know the exact, 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 exact final speeds they've been able to achieve and the exact on how many dims, I I, like I don't know what you class as losing a bunch of performance. I mean, uh, clock speed because I know that you can drop it a lot actually by Mm -hmm. filling all dims. So I know nothing to say, but it'll be better. I don't know if it will be like what we kind of experienced back in like the Skylake days where it didn't really matter that much, right? Like more dims, it was. I think a little harder, but not that much usually. Um, QH Freddy writes in and he says, is AMD in a rush to get Zen 5 out or are they willing to let it slide given how slow Intel will be with Arrow Lake and Lunar Lake? Um, I think they were trying to rush it out late last year. Uh, That's pretty consistently what it sounded like to me. But and by late last year, I don't really mean December. I mean like second half of the year, probably around fall, early fall. Mm -hmm. They were like, let's do this. But then they had more issues than they thought they would need to to solve. And I think they also saw clear evidence that Arrow Lake and Lunar Lake won't be ready <laughs> anytime soon. And so I think AMD made a decision at some point that like, hey, we need more time to finish this. But hey, it also doesn't make sense. So let's just do it quarter three if we can. Uh, that's yeah, my impression. I, yeah, I mean, uh, the, it, when you see Raptor like it's, uh, or sorry, I should say Raptor like refresh, it's hard to be all that worried about what your competitor is doing because they just absolutely pretended a new C, uh, the same CPU as a new one. Like, and it wasn't even as good as we were kind of hoping it would be. Like it wasn't even that good. It was actually yeah. below our low expectations. Yes. So if you're AMD, <laughs> you're looking at that and you're going, yeah, I don't think we got to rush anything guys. So let's just make sure it's as good as possible. So it does feel like a full uplift. And we don't rush out something with bad drivers. That's only 15% better early. Yeah, but AMD isn't far, and I don't think AMD is far enough ahead of where Intel is at right now, where they can be completely complacent. Intel, no, no I think it's a calculated Intel, decision to have a more ready lineup ready to go. I don't think it's just them going, we don't care. Yeah, I- Intel is still in a position where they could look good if Arrow Lake turns out to be as good as it possibly could be, and like Zen Five uh, came out three months later, or something, mm-hmm. or three months later than what it's going to now. Well, speaking about Intel products that are taking forever to come out, let us move on to story number four. Igor's Lab leaks Lunar Lake pictures. 
So quoting here from Igor's lab, with the documented advances in core architecture, better manufacturing technology, and software hardware optimization, Lunar Lake could well redefine expectations of computing performance and energy efficiency for a moment. In particular, the <clears throat> emphasis on integrated graphics performance underscores Intel's commitment to providing robust computing solutions that cover a wide range of applications from productivity to gaming. Indeed, Igor's leak shows a Lunar Lake package soldered onto what is likely a test platform, offering a closer look at Lunar Lake's tight packaging with memory chips on the same substrate right next to the tiled APU. Similar to the Zen 5 shipping manifest leak as well, this means verification of the anticipated success of Meteor Lake is ongoing. The chip could be ready for launch in the second half of this year in some form. Lunar Lake continues the trend of Intel's pure laptop chips integrating as much I.O. as possible into one small package. It has integrated Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and USB 4 Thunderbolt 4 onto it, along with the memory. Not having to include these via chips on the motherboard opens the path to truly compact solutions, or perhaps same size solutions with even bigger batteries. For Igor's information, the XE2 Battle Mage based IGP performs quite well, according to the people he talked to, which supports information presented by Moore's Law said <clears> months <throat> ago, too, where I've actually heard pretty impressive things in terms of efficiency, efficiently gaming. I'm, uh, Lunar Lake so far. So it's exciting. And finally, Igor claims there is a strong cooperation between Intel and Microsoft to get Windows ready for the Lunar Lake SOC. Such cooperation is crucial for laptop chips to optimize how the OS uses up the limited battery power and doubly so for Intel with their heterogeneous core designs. So yeah, I mean, not a ton new here, but it is interesting to see more pictures of it, I think. More evidence that it is, you no, know, it could launch maybe at the end of this year, although it kind of still sounds like to me, it won't be fully rolled out until early next year, possibly. Uh, and then also just to see how many things they are just integrating into the SOC itself. Yeah, I know. That's a lot of crap in it. But <laughs> I mean, this is the this inspires confidence in me a little bit, given that somebody who, who somebody actually has a chip has looked at it and says this seems good. <laughs> And to be or fair, I, part, I've, of course, good. leaked pictures of Arrow Lake and similar test systems. So, yeah. I mean, they're both seemingly, but it is good to, I guess, yeah, <laughs> to see if it's, Intel says they're both coming out in a similar time frame. Evidence that's true. Yeah, it seems like they're the evidence that they've, uh, that has been provided through Intel about their future Lunar Lake and Arrow Lake seems like it might actually be real. And this isn't the, just them blowing smoke up our asses like it kind mm -hmm. of feels like intel has been for the past few years yeah because i guess you have to admit you never know for sure right because like how many years do we have meteor lake samples and pictures only usually from intel though not in test systems just sitting there it didn't really prove anything but hearing igor say similar things that what i am saying where it's like no they're being tested and it's actually performing pretty well is very different than intel just holding up meteor like years before it's supposed to come out or i'm sorry years before it actually comes out and after <laughs> it was supposed to um bfish 36 writes and he says hi tom it looks like Igor got a sample of lunar lake what are you hearing about lunar lake is it a strix competitor in your opinion are four lion cove cores enough for mainstream laptop right because it has four lion cove or skymont except i believe this is just all TSMC with this package, mm. whereas with Air Lake, it's a mix. Um, personally, I, I wonder what you think about this. I'm almost starting to feel like Lunar Lake looks more interesting than Air Lake to me. Like It seems to really be targeting making this perfect 15-watt APU that doesn't need a GPU. Uh, I wish it had 6P cores, mm -hmm. but maybe SkyMount will be good enough. They'll fix latency penalties, and maybe I won't care you know, yeah, I mean, if uh, wait, what's it called? The Skymont, you said, right? I, mm -hmm. Yeah, if Skymont is performant enough and they have their scheduling actually worked out, so the e cores actually are being used to any uh, significant degree, maybe only having four P cores won't be a huge deal. I mean, that's this is just a really big departure from their architectures in the past in general, so. I really feel like it's hard to predict how things will turn out, especially in gaming. It could be that this is just a really good low power device. I mean, mm -hmm. chip for a low power device. And I mean, all I want to see from Intel at this point is then successfully launch something that does well in a niche, which I just don't think they've done for a while. And based on how this is described, it sounds like it actually could go into like a decent handheld gaming device. That's the thing, too, is this looks like this 
I had a couple of contacts tell me, um, not at Intel, but people who work with Intel say that at least what they're seeing with Lunar Lake and presentations, they're like, this just seems like a perfect handheld gaming SOC. The exact amount of cores and threads you need, the exact performance targeting like 10 watts. Like, yeah, that sounds like maybe a really good handheld gaming device. Um, you know, I guess if you think about it right, with Lion Cove, big cores, four of those, and if each one of those, let's say, is like, you know, 35% better or something, or even 25% better than Meteor Lake, and then you look at their little cores, and like the little cores perform kind of like in between Ice Lake and Golden Cove, like, or I guess Tiger Lake and Golden Cove would be a better comparison. Then it's like, well, that is interesting, though. Then you're looking at, yeah, I guess it's just four big, four little. But if these four little cores are performing almost like a really cheap gold, like Alder Lake chip, and then you have four cores that are even better, maybe it's enough. I still can't help but think that like six P cores would have been better for something and more balanced. But, mm-hmm. you know, what do I know? It's because like, well, this is for like premium thin and lights. It's like, yes, but if the graphics are good, could almost push this as like an entry level gaming ship or something but i don't know eight threads seems a little light to me yeah i know you would want it to have there would be not not much to say i don't think if it uh had 12 threads or even 10 like you said if it had six p cores but eight threads is sounds like it might be a bit light we'll see though yeah and i think i think it's always worth remembering though that i think hardware and box did some testing a while ago where they were like it basically seems like even in modern games that benefit from 12 threads or more, if you have eight threads, it's still fun and they're faster. It doesn't seem to make a difference if the cores are that much stronger, like eight Zen four core, like eight Zen four threads are totally up there with 12 of like something else in gaming from the past, even though you'd think it'd be. And that even like, to this day, like the i7 6700K still seems to age okay. Like it's, it just, it seems like engines don't bog down as long as you have eight. And it does have eight. So, you mm-hmm. know. And then I think it also has, I think, if I remember correctly, two little cores for extra little cores also though for background tasks. So there you go. I don't know. Maybe that'll make up for that too. Jensen Wang, great leader CEO. Wow. A lot of questions from him this week. Back in 2015, if AMD had got perfect in quotes A0 Silicon for Zen and launched it in June or July of 2016, so basically like almost a year before when they actually did, do you think Intel would have woken up earlier and be in a better place current day? What do you what do you think, Dan? Because I think that's something we talked about agnosium that we don't talk about much anymore. But we used to all the time talk about like the fact that we couldn't believe Intel Deb. KB Lake launching next to like Zen one and then coffee Lake with just six cores and then coffee Lake with just eight cores and then comet Lake with just 10 cores. Like how the hell didn't they go to six cores right away and then 10 cores right away? Like all of these steps make absolutely like they clearly weren't taking them seriously. Like, do you think they would have skipped quicker if it launched sooner? I I mean, so that would be a scenario or, in AMD was really only stagnant for two years ish, I guess, two, two, three years because Pile Driver was. That still would have been like four, but. Well, they would have had AMD, I mean, Bulldozer in 2012, then Pile Driver in uh, 2013, I think. And those weren't great architectures, but if they, if they had that and then two years later, it, 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 AMD proved that they weren't really stagnant anymore, I think. Yeah, Intel wouldn't have gotten as complacent, or would have wouldn't have thought that AMD was a complete, completely out of the picture. Uh, yeah, because so, I mean, let me see, release, or was it six? Is it X? What was it called? X release. Oh, I was in a nine nine. I keep, I've got I'm forgetting. And then it was six nine. What was it? Fifty. X released? Is that the name of that damn thing? I'm trying to remember. It was. It was called the i7-6950X, the Broadwell E <clears throat> 10 core. So, yeah, I guess the one thing that really would have changed is Intel would have launched their $1,700 10 core. Like, basically, the almost the same month AMD launches something better. 
Probably, probably would have woken them up more because I think the way they thought about it was, well, look, they're beating Broadwell, but that's from last year. So who cares? You know, yeah, and Zen one at the time when when Zen one came out, it was like it had been five years since they really released a new desktop architecture. Uh, <laughs> and even their new architecture, while it looked potentially promising, it, it could have been an Alder Lake moment where. You know what I mean? Like in hindsight, mm -hmm. where we talked about Alder Lake, is, is this their Zen moment or whatever? Well, it could have gone the other way back then, too. Or what if Zen, Zen Plus and Zen 2 and Zen 3 didn't do anything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, yeah. Because well, it looks like a dead cat bounce, not saving the company. Yeah, because Zen, Zen 1 only looks as good as it does now in hindsight. Because back then, Zen 1 was just an improvement. And, oh, there is a reason to buy AMD sometimes now. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was it was an interesting time. It's still fun to talk about every now and then, just like the opinions online of people that were just like, well, Zen isn't even really good. It still loses in gaming. And me going, guys, they're they're using a worse node. That <laughs> what are you doing? They're, they're selling something that's yeah, it's weaker, but it actually uses that much less energy. So it's actually the same efficiency on a worse node, too. This is crazy. I just I know some people still didn't see it, but you know now obviously everyone does. If you look at Amazon, well, now CPU uh, you need sales. a nuclear reactor to power an Intel CPU, so mm -hmm. a refrigerator to cool it. Uh, all right, let us then move on to story number five. Microsoft Copilot requirements for 40 tops confirmed. Tom Lewin, VP of Intel Client Computing Group via Tom's Hardware, quoting here. But to your point, there's going to be a continuum or an evolution where then we're going to go to the next era gen AI PC with a 40 tops requirement in the NPU. We have our next gen product that's coming that will be in that category. And as we go into that next gen, it's just going to enable us to run more things locally, just like they will run Copilot with more elements of Copilot running locally on the client. That may not mean that everything in Copilot is running local, but you'll get a lot of key capabilities that will show up running on the MPU. Indeed, we've been hearing rumors of Windows 12 or Windows 11 AI needing around 40 tops of Int 8 for a long time now, something that was leaked by this channel. Now, this specification was confirmed at Tom's Hardware at Intel's AI Summit. This requirement puts AMD's Phoenix and Intel's Meteor Lake squarely in their place as stepping stones to the real PC AI and fully confirms it. We will have to wait for Strix, Lunar Lake, and Qualcomm's X Elite to bring the performance required to run Microsoft Copilot AI, sweet on the device itself. However, the upcoming Zen 5 Ryzen desktop parts seem to lack machine learning capabilities, and Air Lake is, per this channel's information, offering performance that seems just like 13 tops in line with Meteor Lake. Well, for desktop parts, perhaps GPU will be utilized and running Copilot on cloud is not as big of an issue with a constant internet connection with an Ethernet plugged into your desktop. But Air Lake and FireRange laptops could find themselves in an odd position of offering the best laptop CPU performance, but not fulfilling Microsoft's mm -hmm. AI demands. At least FireRange will likely be a niche part, but Air Lake should fill a significant part of Intel's laptop range going into 2025. And I continue to feel like Intel's talking out of both sides of their mouth on this AI thing, where they're like, we believe in AI, AI is everywhere. We also have the weakest AI PCs, and Air Lake only is going to have 13 tops, which will be 90% of our production or something. So I just I just find that very weird. Um, and the only thing I would add to this is I do wonder if like AI really does get utilized, actually utilized in like Windows 12 or something this year, mm -hmm. that AMD will go, well, okay, the yields of Strix Halo that have barely any G because I saw some documents that suggested some Strix Halos could be cut down to 20 CUs. Mm. Who knows? Maybe that's what they'll do. They'll have like fire range over here for these people. And that will usually come with like a dedicated NVIDIA GPU anyways. But then oh, if so you that, want the GPU will do the cover the AI performance basically. Yeah, but it won't have good battery life. That's probably what AMD is thinking of doing anyways and why they're not including it because they're like any 16 core fire range is going to come with a dedicated NVIDIA card in, in anyway, so who cares? But then also they might have a niche option where it's like, well, on this subset of a subset of yields of Strix Halo, you know, we have these disabled parts anyways that have a 50 tops NPU. You can pair this with actually double the RAM too with this. And this could be like this premium ultra PC or something with a 5090 laptop. But that, that's what I would suggest. I think AMD has more options to cover their bases. With Intel, I don't know. I don't think you're putting Lunar Lake with a gaming graphics card. So I, don't, I actually do think it's more Intel that's going to be in a weird position here on laptop. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, but I don't know what you thought about this. We've been talking about, but it's finally confirmed the 40 tops thing. I mean, yeah, I, I, we kind of knew this was going to happen for, I think, months now at this point. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I will say I do think Microsoft is putting its uh, partners in an interesting position this generation. And uh, for Arrow Lake in general and then for uh, Fire Range, I don't know. Maybe that will just kind of deflate their sales a little uh, uh, metaphorical sales so to speak uh because i i don't know it to, to me it seems like i if i were amd and intel i would have wanted them to push this requirement like maybe a year from now when they can have a npu and every sing, or sufficiently powerful npu in every single one of their uh apus but or i should say laptop cpus uh but i guess that's just not what they're doing <laughs> I, I i don't really know what else to add to that no, uh, I think what's going on, Dan, personally, is they're just trying to get ahead of Apple. I think Microsoft no, knows something true. we don't, that Apple is going to go gangbusters with AI marketing with some upcoming chip. Well, they they don't have a – does Apple have their own LLM or their own oh, GPT? Uh, yeah. you, you, they're going to – yeah. Like the, whether they've announced it or well, you know it's or, going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think when you're Microsoft, you're like, Jesus Christ, Apple's beaten us to the punch on so many things. They have taken market share with lap book, uh, with MacBooks. But they're stagnating a little bit right now. Huh. If we could beat them to the punch with like real locally run AI, this finally is a differentiating thing that we have besides a bunch of constantly refreshed versions of paint apps that don't work that we for no reason change constantly you know this would be a real feature before for sure apple's going to have locally run assistance on like all iPhones in a year or two and i think and that's again i think that's what microsoft is thinking is well too bad you know tough shit amd and intel at the end of the day we want this to be there if you need to put a gpu with it i guess you need to but if you know what's good for you get this stuff out and i think amd mm-hmm. saw presentations like this about a year ago and they said, all right, well, we're going to move the AI engine in Strix Halo, put it in Strix Point, put it in Kraken, put it in everything. And you guys over there, figure out a way to make Hawkpoint have more tops. <laughs> like, and I think that's what happened. You know, and I think it, Intel just said, I guess we'll just still use 13 tops in Air Lake for some freaking reason. But that's still baffling to me. But I, I, I there's just, OEMs know. people being briefed that Air Lake is 13 tops as this channel leaked. Um, so I, I don't know, you know. It seems like they're not going to change pace on that. Maybe they can put a new SOC tile in Arrow Lake 2.0. If they don't, though, that's mind-boggling to me that they would just keep using 13 tops on most of their stuff until then. But, you know, from Microsoft's perspective, they're like, well, there will be winners and losers, but we think Windows will win if we do this before Apple. That's what I think is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, Amy Will Chief writes in, he says, hey, Tom, what do you think about the new AI key that Microsoft is looking to make mandatory for Windows certified OEM keyboards? Has this AI hype gone just a bit too far? Why not just replace the Windows logo key? Could things get any zanier in AI land? Well, we what have, do you think, Dan? We have already made fun of this on this channel before, but I think the I think at least as it exists right now, the Copilot feature is not that great. I played with it a little bit. Oh, I haven't this. actually messed with it yet. Yeah. Tell me about it. So, I think it, it, I think it's just a way to try to get you to subscribe to ChatGPT. Uh, like every time you open it, it says "Get Copilot Pro." And how much does this that Copilot Pro Pro cost? Jesus, twenty dollars every month. I don't see what utility this offers. That it's twenty dollars every month. I'll say that right off the bat. I'm sure it's a lot better if you get out, out, out of the free version, but if you want to do image generation with Copilot, you have to buy coins or something, or it will run it slowly if you don't buy coins for it, so that's nice. Uh, you have to reset your chat window every 30 messages, which is interesting. So just mm-hmm. once you get to 30, they're like, you're out of it for this session, so reset it, which is... Feels like it's still an alpha then. And then, as usual, I asked, <laughs> I asked it to actually do something that would be okay. like useful and helpful, uh, and it spit out a bunch of nonsense. So, what did you ask it to do? Can you tell me? Oh, uh, I mean, I asked it. Um, I, I, I asked it a uh, specific like science question, uh, like for a pers- for doing some procedure, 
And it made weird generalizations about things that didn't make sense. I asked it to clarify things. And when it clarifies things, it just gets even worse. <laughs> and then eventually I was like, that's not how that works. And it's like, you're right. I'm sorry. So it's, it's still the same uh, crap you get with any uh, GPT. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to see how it turns out with Windows 12 or Windows 11 AI, whatever they call it later this year but at the moment i'm not seeing the evidence that it yeah, really saves us time on anything just from my my experience with it if you're if you attempt to give any gpt an actual prompt where it has to give you something real that maybe you wouldn't think of it's not useful it's good for answering homework questions maybe but that's about it yeah so you think it might I be don't. overkill to have an AI button on there. I just want to know what the AI button would always do because, like, spacebar. Well, we know what spacebar could mean, well, enter the, or the, space. The Windows button, like, pull up search or something. Yeah, the, the, the pilot button will, or co-pilot button will just put, pull up the co-pilot window. Right, it, it, and presumably. so wouldn't, but to have a dedicated button, that would mean that presumably there's want every it. app will have it integration and every app if i press it i should just be able to say hey make this powerpoint hey do this hey skype called like type of a message to, for dan they want you to be using copilot as much as the start menu is what i that's what they would be that. suggesting yeah yeah and i don't think it's at all proven that copilot has that amount of utility mm. yeah yeah i don't know i'm just kind of sh- I, I think i might agree that it's sh- shooting the gun a little bit here to like early to jumping the gun. You mean jumping the gun? Yeah. I was like, I know I'm saying this wrong. Jumping the gun a little bit here to think that we need to mandate it. I don't think it's the dumbest idea if OEMs want to add it, but to mandate it, I mean, what that tells you is they are betting on AI. It's just, I haven't seen the evidence yet that I'm going to use it in every single app I use, which basically is what you're suggesting by making it a dedicated button. Yeah. I I mean, just to me, I think every tech company in San Francisco, or, yeah, every tech company in the West Coast at this point thinks AI is the way to go. And they think a lot of people are chomping at the bit to pay $20 a month to use. Uh, I, I don't even know, like to, to replace Google with Google that tells you things wrong more often um, and sometimes makes weird grammar mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And, I guess we'll see. I'm not And also yet. give uh, your professor a very good tell if you're cheating. Okay. Because uh, it, anytime you ask one of these models anything, it will summarize by saying overall, comma, and then they'll summarize <laughs> what it t- just told you. <laughs> God, imagine being oh. a professor and half of your students just give you the same sentence in the beginning. A yeah, joke. Uh, uh, seriously. Uh, Overall is going to start becoming a like that's an indicator that you've cheated on your homework at this point. <laughs> um all right. Let us move on to the next story with story number six. Bessie is ready for spring. She's excited to get outside and well and start carrying around entire tree branches that she just thinks are S-tier sticks. Which really they can't be that healthy for her, although can imagine they're really any more unhealthy than the typical ramen people are eating on a busy workday. Well, of course, that is unless they eat Vite Ramen. This piece of content is brought to you by Vite Ramen. Vite Ramen is a healthy, tasty, and shelf-stable food crafted by an American startup that offers tons of options for eating healthy, like their classic packages that make it easy to add protein and other ingredients of your choice, or also their Ramen Go packages that offer a healthy, microwavable option for those who truly only have a 15-minute lunch break when they are away from home. And you know, I also need to take a second to promote their Nano Boost Vitality Powder as well. Seriously, this is a fantastic alternative to coffee that you'll find me drinking in many Broken Silicon episodes when I'm forced to record late at night, and I truly do believe it blows away their competition. You have to understand, I've been working with the people at Vite for years now, and I have a lot of freedom in what I can promote from their website. And Out of the things they make, I have to say, it blows away the competition. This thing tastes great. It's easy to mix into water. You never has that sand-like texture their competitors often have. And so I really cannot recommend that enough in addition to just basically everything on their website. You know, going to their website and buying something from Bite Ramen 
that directly supports this channel and it supports a sponsor that's been good to the Moore's Law's Dead team for many years. So I really do like their products, all of them, especially their ramen and Nano Boost Vitality Powder, and I can't recommend them enough. So support Moore's Law Zed by supporting Vite today. Following GDC, multiple reports surface of devs doubting Xbox future. As developers return home from GDC, many of them are sharing stories that were shared with them at said event about how Xbox seems to be in a full capitulation right now. Chris String at, gaming, at gamesindustry.biz said that, and I'm quoting, Xbox sales have been falling all throughout last year, and it's failing, falling even harder this year. The phrase one major company who released a big game last year said was, I don't know why we bothered supporting this console. Now you've got third-party publishers going, you know, we're putting a lot of effort uh, trying to create an Xbox Series S version when an X version of a game, when, to be honest, with for you, for us, the market is PC and PS5. I think Xbox is in real trouble as a hardware manufacturer, and that was the thing that came out for me at GDC. Perk was string, things amongst developers looked like for Xbox, the quote really says it all. Xbox is not selling consoles. It's not selling games for developers. And meanwhile, the leadership, namely Phil Spencer, seems to be panicking due to Game Pass, lack of rentability and long-term viability. And we are seeing the entire Xbox project going through a serious crisis. Meanwhile, the last episode of Broken Silicon as well, another former dev who was also at GDC this year confirmed that conversations involving Xbox with people he spoke with at GDC consistently steer negative, with nobody having any confidence that Microsoft is committed to Xbox. And that the delay to start next-gen development is that it sounds like they basically just started work on the next-gen Xbox, as leaked by this channel, could severely hurt which games are ready for it at launch if it is rushed out quickly. So yeah, it was interesting. Like I didn't really notice this right away because I don't pay that much attention to this type of stuff, but Putting together the notes for this episode, I noticed that like what I heard from a developer that was at GDC is being parroted by tons of other developers on other podcasts and interviews where it's like you go on a podcast for an hour, you're a developer. They're like, what do people think about this? Ah, oh, you know, maybe it's good. PSVR 2 is coming to PC. It doesn't seem to be doing well there. Someone, what do you think about this? Oh, you know, we're going to use AI to help accelerate tools and do this. Oh, there's been a lot of layoff talk. And then anytime someone on the podcast to a developer brings up, well, what do people say about Xbox at GDC? They're always like, oh, I don't know. Uh, we can't get any games to make money on their console anymore. And it seems like there are stores not cover selling it in Europe. And we uh, basically every conversation is negative. It's just, it's interesting to see yeah. like what happened on broken cell comes parroted on a bunch of other gaming podcasts in the past week. Yeah. Well, I mean what you have, we've been talking about this for years. Uh, the people at sacred symbols have been talking about this for years. Or I should just say uh, last stand media in general have been talking about it for years being mm -hmm. the problem. And I just don't know how you couldn't read the tea leaves that this is the direction it will be going. They're a massive company. They're just getting bigger for some reason. And they're pushing a service that makes things that everything they're trying to sell from a hardware perspective kind of outdated. Because why would you why would you buy an Xbox at this point? I, I just really don't get it. And why would you buy a game if you own an Xbox? They're telling you. Your ba the Xbox is now supposed to be the box y you get for the game version of Netflix. Mm -hmm. So they're creating an environment where people don't want to buy video games on there anymore because all their video games are quote unquote free. Uh, what is it? Twenty dollars a month? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're not actually free. You're paying like I believe you're buying a game every month. Yeah, that you don't buying, keep. <laughs> you're well. You're buying a full game every three months, technically. But it, I mean, if you're buying more than four games a year and you don't actually care about curating that list of games that you buy every year, maybe it's good. But like you have no that's a giant whatsoever. You just walk into Best Buy and spin around and that one. <laughs> like I want to play Nights on Bikes and I want to play the version that doesn't work. Have online co-op, which is <laughs> we thought the whole point of that, not to go back into something we've talked about before. <laughs> I, I know, but I just think it reveals how off their strategy was with Game Pass. Um, you know what's not and, on it? Hell Divers 2, the game everyone can't stop talking about. So great. Yeah, I know. And then they have a bunch of studios that need to have cash flow now. Be, uh, and there's like 40 of them. I don't know how you sustain a studio, 40 studios on a budget of $20 a month from 
however many people are actually bothering to buy it. What is it like 30, still less than 30 million? Right. Because they combine Xbox gold with that. So it's become murky, but yeah, like maybe 20 to 25, 20 to let's just call it 20 to 30 million actually getting the version of game pass that pays that much. I mean, it's just at a certain point going to have to be you've, I mean, really what's going on with subscription services is you've just figured out a way to spend more money on something um, and you just don't own anything now. Yay! Innovation. (laughs) And I know there's the peer, like physical purists that say, well, you technically don't own a game that you buy digitally because you're buying a license for it, which I get that's true. But you, you, what you have there is a lot more akin to owning something than Mm -hmm. what you have with game pass where the second you stop subscribing to it you have no access to any of those games ever again Mm -hmm. and 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 again you know no matter how you dice it it's just like well right but if you like buy a game digitally on steam you can come back in two years and play banner lord again which i do (laughs) and if all you did is get me four games a year and then i go back to game pass and that game's no longer on it which happens all the time it's like and that did happen. I remember which one it was, but I was like, "Oh, I was going to play that this month that I got Game Pass for like for free, or was a dollar." And I'm like, "Oh, so that game I waited to play this month has already been removed. From, I'm, I'm out. Like this is not worth the money." And I think what you have is a situation where a lot of people have just moved to other platforms, or they have been told by Microsoft not to pay for games. And that for me is the most damning thing is just seeing things like if it's not. If Microsoft, basically the consensus I'm starting to hear from developers is if Microsoft won't pay us to have it on Game Pass, we don't want to put it on Xbox. That's the only way it's going to make money on that console anyways. Yeah, because the only way you would want to, the only way you would want to sell a console on, I mean, not a console, a game on that console at this point, I think is, all right, Microsoft, we project we would have had like 15 million sales on this or so, on your console. Well, probably not 15 because of how much it's sold, but we predict 5 million sales that's how much you want we want you to pay us like mm-hmm. that that's the only reason that you would put a triple a game on game pass mm-hmm. yeah and well i mean let me see here let me, let me pull out one of these reader mails that was near the end of it uh right now jensen wayne great leader ceo writes in yet again and he says is the continued sales success of the switch and developers desire for their games to run on its meager hardware helping xbox every game that can run on the switch should run on the xbox series s easily and that means developers have a reason to not uh be ps5 console exclusive could this mean if nintendo has an ample supply they should uh and they should of the switch 2 with 12 gigabytes ram that because it's an animator they could cause developers to go Switch 2 plus PS5, not even bothering to deal with the Xbox Series S RAM problems, and the Xbox console base not buying games. So, for, first of all, in, the, in this story we just discussed, like developers are finding it annoying to develop on the Xbox Series S, period, and also not making any money on it. And so, without the Switch, this is why they would skip it already. Like, you might as well... Put in the effort to get Hogwarts running on the Switch. Yeah, it'll come out later. Yeah, it loads every time you fart or something. But they got it running on the Switch, which is crazy. And maybe it took more work, but here's what they know. It's going to sell millions of copies on the Switch. It's not going to sell millions of copies on the Xbox. And so that's why they wouldn't bother doing that already. It's not that it wouldn't technically be easier to fit it on the Series S. It would be. But it's still going to take some work, and if no one's going to buy it, they might just rather put in even more effort to get it running on the Switch. And yeah, I mean, the second part of your reader mail, if the Switch 2 has 12 gigabytes of RAM, I think the Series S is fucked. I mean, that's just going to be it. They're going to say this console yeah. is not worth wasting our time. No one buys games. And now Nintendo is easier to develop for anyways. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could see that being the case. I, I mean, the fact that they're... The fact that the Nintendo... Well, to be fair, Nintendo's not really asking that anyone develops on their thing it's just when a studio is motivated to do enough they they do it uh because it will sell a lot but mm-hmm. the series s that's just yeah I, mean, I don't know there's not really that big of a motivation to buy it unless people are actually going to ba- buy games on the series s which mm-hmm. i mean let's be honest the series s is the worst case for people wanting to buy games because it's the cheapest console that uh, uh, has a subscription service attached to it so I would bet that that's the console that a lot of people get for like their kids because they don't want them constantly asking them to buy them something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, again, but then that could just become the switch pretty too, pretty quickly. If, 
It could. Yeah, if the Switch 2 was stronger than the Series S, or at least had more RAM than the Series S, uh, yeah, the Series S is screwed. Yeah, I, I think. Um, all right, well, on that cheery note, let us <laughs> move on <laughs> to the wrap-up here. These are, of course, the stories that we didn't think deserved a full uh discussion but should be mentioned nonetheless like for example zen 3 5000 xt series which when i saw that i was like wait what's the story who cares and i was like oh yeah there was zen 2 like 3900 xt faster clock chips i guess they haven't done that with zen 3 and they're still planning to and i saw that video cards why cry in his write-up said something that's run below the radar including our own admittedly is that i guess amd is going to do a new release of faster clock zen 3 chips on am4 i don't know that i have much to say about this except i guess they probably only have good <clears throat> enough yields for it now with how mature the process is and they see no point in not adding that extra few percent of performance to it i mean am4 still has a pretty large in, uh, install base i they, they, I bet there are still a f- few people on Zen 1 or Zen Plus that could be motivated to buy like a really powerful CPU for uh, AM4. Mm-hmm. Uh, or 3% better, Dan, or whatever it ends up being. Um, <laughs> yes. But PCIe 7.0 specification is now available. Don't have much to say, but there it is. Dan, there will be PCIe 7.0. It will have the bandwidth you expected it to. Wait, so you're telling me it's going to be faster than PCIe 6? heard it here well now we know for sure there's been some of those lazily written articles on rumor websites they're just like it's been rumored for a long time that pcie gen 7 would have more than gen 6 but we should still take this rumor with a grain of salt it's like like, guys you don't always have to add grain of salt to the end of your article you know it will be faster (laughs) isn't the the yeah i I don't know it's just funny I, i i know this happens every every time a new spec gets certified but it's it's always a little funny it's like and you guys, you would have never guessed that we did what we said, what we do every li- single time when we release a new spec. <laughs> mm-hmm. But as it's worth mentioning, it is coming. Um, also, NVIDIA announced, or I guess really released, DLSS 3.7. So I don't have much to say here, but you almost got to wonder if like they were just working on this and working on this and polishing it and then they just the week they're like amd will announce new fsr at some point right they do boom up well we have 3.7 whatever (laughs) again it's it's this thing of like all right amd where's 3.2 there's 3.5 3.2 yeah like prove you're gonna keep innovating because nvidia is not sitting still yeah amd definitely needs to get its ass in gear um also xe super sampling 1.3 almost like all these companies were waiting to announce this stuff at the same time i don't have much to say about this i'm more interested in just seeing the testing um but again actually there's been some outlets that have said that xe super sampling is now starting to make fsr look bad too and again they really even intel releases an updated one right after amd does i mean yeah i all i have to go by is that uh screenshot uh, it, it, <laughs> or the, is a screenshot that i'm looking at right now at I've got to say the before did not look very good, but it looks pretty good now. Um, yeah, it's, it's always a weird choice when they choose to, cho- to do a horrible example, but they're like, look how much better it is. And it's like, hmm, you're kind of admitting the prior one wasn't that good sometimes, <laughs> aren't you? Well, um, we can pr- we can say it was now, now that we don't have to pretend it was good. <laughs> um, this actually was a little annoying that I saw this here. Uh, Windows 10 security updates to cost $61 after 2025 as they try to force you to get the AI Copilot spam version. Well, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I guess they really want to get everyone on Windows uh, 11. Or 12 soon. Yeah, or 12. Microsoft, my advice would have been release an operating system that people actually want, but Mm -hmm. I guess not. There's no need for 11. They should just wait for 12. Yeah, and call it 11. Um, also, you sent this one to me at the last minute. Uh, Roku Pan invents a way to show ads over anything you plug into your TV. I mean, good. I will never buy a Roku TV. Wasn't planning to. They're current. It's currently supposed to only be when it's not dis- uh, displaying any like moving information or anything. It's like, oh, cool. I really like how you're just going to inject ads if I'm watching anything on one of your TVs. But imagine how annoying it would be. Like, so what does that mean? If I if I like pause hell divers too i don't on know my tv and there's technically no motion i guess that wouldn't be a good example because it's not yeah but okay let me back up if you pause horizon <laughs> which is a single player game entirely 
so does there's no motion is that mean even if i'm like looking at a map even if there's no motion on the map does that mean if i'm just like looking at a menu and deciding what graphical setting i want on a playstation is it just gonna go hey we noticed no movement for 10 seconds guess what buy pringles like because <laughs> hopefully fuck it's that. not that I, if it were that intrusive i i i hope they wouldn't be dumb enough to be that intrusive but I mean, companies really want to figure out how to inject ads. So I, I wouldn't put anything past a lot of these companies at this point. Techno writes in and he says, unfortunately, of all the things I wish was an April Fool's joke, this isn't one with Microsoft end of life in Windows 10. How badly do you think Microsoft getting rid of Windows 10 updates will boomerang back at them and cause Linux to be the main operating distro? Oh, I don't see that happening that quickly. But I will say, I do see more and more people in the comments say they just use Linux as their operating system. And stupid um, things like this, it nibbles away here and there. What, but I don't see this being it. I, I, I'm probably going to sound like an idiot asking this because I don't remember the name for the term. But what's the name of the like uh, compatibility software for uh, Wine? What? Wine? Is that what you're thinking of? Does, what, what does, uh, is that the one that Steam Deck uses? I think they just have their own thing. I mean, I, okay, I mean, well, now you're going to make me sound stupid. With with software like that existing on Linux, I mean, the better it gets. Yeah, I I could see myself switching to Linux at some point in the future. I'm not going to do it now, but Microsoft is really tempting people that have the slightest degree of tech <laughs> technical understanding uh, switching over to Linux because I don't know if it's not trying to sell me stuff constantly i might like that more <laughs> and, and they, it works you know what's crazy they still have the audacity to sometimes try to charge you like a hundred dollars for the operating system itself when they're already starting to nickel and dime you with like microsoft 365 and all this other shit it's just yeah ridiculous. i'm sorry if, you, if you're making me subscribe to microsoft 365 you're making me subscribe to your new feature that you are mandating have uh hardware dedicated to it you're making me subscribe to that also Sorry, your your operating system should be free because you are mm-hmm. now a live service platform. Congratulations, you've turned your operating system into Fortnite. Good job. Mm-hmm. Um, TMC Payton writes him, and he says, "Would you wager a PS5 Pro that Nintendo launches their Switch successor in 2025?" I'm pretty close to getting to that. I mean, that's what a lot of rumors have suggested. Uh, I have no reason to really doubt them, and I. Th- I don't remember. I think I, 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 it kind of sounds like that as well. So I think the way I would actually answer this question is, well, forget my leaks and anyone else's leaks about the switch too. Guys, it's April. If there isn't like hardware pictures leaking in a couple months or an announcement at computech, they're like run. Like it's yeah, it's too late. It's not coming out this year then. Yeah. And I would say though with uh, Nintendo, I, I mean, I guess I don't know if he means do do you think it's definitely coming out in 25 instead of 24? I mean, if we see nothing by June, I don't think there's a chance it's coming out this year. And if it doesn't come out in 2025, I think there's a lot of, uh, that would be pretty strong evidence that something is going wrong at Nintendo. Oh, it's going to come out next year. I'm not worried about that. I, I don't know why the, uh, I would be worried about it. Nintendo's seems to be functioning pretty well right now. <laughs> Um, Cypher Cookie writes in and he says, so with the PS5 Pro coming out, do you think Sony will make it easy to transfer SSDs from the old PS5? I know from experience upgrading uh, external SSDs, it doesn't work well. Do you think this will be a major thing that needs to be fixed to make the PS5 Pro experience seamless for anyone upgrading? Um, So number one, going from the PS4 to the PS4 Pro, you just plug it in Ethernet and it literally does it all for you. I have no reason to believe the operating system will look any different, that they won't let you transfer everything the same way. I just imagine the only thing you'd have to worry about is it's like, well, so do you mean your extra SSD that you bought separately and put in the PS5? Because if that's what you're talking about, oh, then yeah, yeah all that's going to happen is I would suggest you delete everything off of there move everything over, but then all your save files and organization will be there. And then you plug in the new SSD and redownload everything. I, that's the only thing I can think you could possibly mean, though. Yeah, but in, in this day and age, it's... Unless he means, like, unless he's expecting something like the PS4, where, like, if you had an SSD in your base PS4, and you wanted to put the SSD in the the other one, then it's like, uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know. Like, you kind of have to get the new SSD in there first or something. I, I don't know. Yeah, Although I think there I mean, may have been a way to back it up 
move it over, put it in. I think there was. There's probably some way to do it. I I, I don't know. I think console manufacturers are generally pretty good about there being some way to transfer things if there's an upgrade path. Mm -hmm. Um, But... uh, yeah, you could clone I, I, I the drive also, <clears throat> and then just have a hard drive have it be cloned. Yeah, I think you could do that, though, couldn't you, with the PS4? You might have to have a device, but you could have also just taken a PS4. The PS4 Pro comes with one terabyte. Your PS4 has one terabyte SSD for some reason. Clone it, put the new S, the old SSD in the PS4 Pro, move that back to there, and then clone again with the Ethernet. Like, so there, there's, there's ways. There's also, just in this day and age, like... Okay, all of your saves are probably saved on cloud storage. Uh, in a lot of places, I, at least most places I've lived in the past for the past several years, gigabit is an option, and fi- like five hundred megabit really isn't that expensive. And there isn't really a data cap that's a big deal either. It's almost just like I don't know, just signing in and downloading your crap really isn't that difficult anymore like it used right because like, really the most annoying. important thing is it's going to move over your saves how you've organized your libraries and your like profile stuff so just delete as many games as you can use the ethernet to move it over take your old extra ssd put it in and just redownload games but yeah. all your saves and organization and stuff would still be there yeah so to, to me even if you have to redownload some stuff it's not that big of a deal these days but <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't see. I, I'd be surprised if there was some big issue because, at least from what I saw with previous gens, it became very easy. Um, Techno writes in again. He says, "With Nvidia being banned from selling the 4090D, will they just sell it with a default TDP of 220 watts and one gigahertz clock speed to get it under the line uh, that it's worse than a 4070 Ti when not overclocked? Would have each manufacturer have a 450 and 600 watt BIOS so they can just flash that and get over the restriction?" I see this as a loophole, which otherwise will cause NVIDIA to sue the Senate if they permanently closed off. So Carbon Cry writes in and says, providing such a BIOS directly would be sanctioned circumvention and illegal, and they would get in trouble. However, if somehow an NVIDIA server or partner got hacked easily and the BIOS that they needed was on those servers, well, then that would be a way to get around <laughs> it. And that is one thing I would suggest as well. That, I don't know if I'm ever going to do a video about this, but like I keep hearing weird things about how NVIDIA is doing business and getting around sanctions and stuff. And it's like, Techno, it's not entirely insane to think they would have this super low TDP, sell them in China legally, and then, oh, oops, the BIOS for 450 watts got leaked. Like that, I don't think they're necessarily a, you know, companies, this can happen. You know, mm-hmm. it would be like that though. I, they couldn't do it directly though. Or they would be circumventing sanctions, right? Mm. So, um, all right. And I think I got a few more here. Bullethead writes in, so was there a pile of RX 550 GPUs just lying around somewhere? Because this seems like a really weird product to release right now because ASRock just announced, I guess, a new RX 550. Um, You know, there's all types of weird operations like this. I doubt ASRock would do what's going on here because, but... One thing I just want to mention is when sometimes when you see these like, oh, it's not next to me. It's I think it's behind me up there, actually. Oh, watch this, Dan. I'm going to be really Ooh. cool. It's a, uh, let me do this. All right. Actually, the 580 I'm talking about is right there. <laughs> um, like it comes from, I, I think it was called Max Sun. A lot of these companies, what they do is they will go through like landfills or Buy up cheap GPUs for ten bucks. Everything from an RX, like uh, an HD seven nine seventy to an R nine three ninety X. All of those used GDR five. So if you see some cards that still use GDR five, but they have like a low clock speed for some reason on the RAM, they may have taken an old GPU's RAM that someone sold on eBay for twenty bucks, taken the RAM chips off, taken a Polaris die put it on a board, and then put a new cooler on it and called it new manufacture. That's the only thing I can suggest. I kind of doubt ASRock did that here, but they probably had these dies lying around and found a trove of this GDR5. And actually, I have heard that AIBs have done that with the RAM. Like, they will buy up secondhand RAM that is like where there's like a small outfit in India or China looking for all of these old GDDR5 <laughs> cards and then selling them as new RAM chips to the AIB. And as long as it works, the AIB doesn't care. Stuff like this does happen. 
maybe they have all these Polaris chips lying around and they finally secured a deal with one of these outfits to get the RAM like for crazy cheap. And then they sell this to some, I don't know who, I don't know who wants, I don't know who wants now. this, but <laughs> yeah. Um, Falto writes in, he says, small YouTuber here is a hobby guy. Any advice you can give me when it comes to making thumbnails? I suck really hard at them right now. You know, every YouTuber goes through this period of good or bad thumbnails, I think, or a lot of us did. Uh, and I think it's just a lot about style and opinion. Like, no one's necessarily right. There are different ways to have good thumbnails. But a decision I made is I'm not going to become part of the trend of being some white guy pointing at a thing. <laughs> because I so many channels copied that form of thumbnail that they all started to blend together. And I think that was a good decision. Also, I hate things like all caps in white. I think it looks hard to read and ridiculous. Use a good font, consistent colors, so people see a color pattern and go, oh, isn't that Tom with the yellow text or something? And I, I, yeah, I think, uh, I think one of the, ba- the ones that I see is overused a lot uh, by a ton of different YouTubers is this. I'm doing the thing where they're doing this. Stuff yeah, like this. that. Or just this. <laughs> no, if you, you can be in the thumbnails if you're doing something else creative with it, but specifically being like on the li- right or left side making some weird emote is every. And, and then if you do it. that every thumbnail, then everyone knows it's never interesting. Yeah, it's the same. They have to do it with every video. Uh, so, and they're trying. They're trying to overreact. They're overreacting to whatever they're talking about in those thumbnails. Yeah, I know. I it's can't the, believe what AMD just it, announced, and it's just like a driver update. It's the uh, I've heard the the Mister Beastification of YouTube thumbnails because that's what Mister Beast does with every one of his thumbnails. But usually he'll have his own way of doing it, and if everyone well, does it who isn't Mister Beast, it's not going to stand out. Well, no, that was more more so that was his style. Even if I think it looks kind of stupid, but. Hey, Mr. Beast is, I think, like the richest YouTuber on the planet. Mm-hmm. So who am I to criticize him? But again, practices? people will look at your thumbnail and they will see it's not Mr. Beast. Yeah. So doing the same type of thumbnail is a quick way to get someone to also click, oh, he's just, and I've done this before. I saw some people basically entirely copying how real life lore's thumbnails Oh, yeah, look. yeah, you've told me about that. And I just... Told YouTube, don't send me these anymore. I, it's fucking stupid. I wanted to watch a real life war video, and now I've got people just spamming the same looking thumbnails. And this is a quick way for me to ignore them because they're not real life war. There's no title under it that says that. And so I think it's actually it is important to find your own style. It is because people will see your style. Remember, they saw it with you first, and then they won't be annoyed that they saw it. And it's just a bit of an art making it eye catching, but also not overdoing it so that nothing's eye-catching if they all are too eye-catching and also i would say it's usually less is a bit more not as much as some people i think you always have to have oh my god amd as a thumb you don't always have to have the simplest shit but i think there is an art to like maybe if you could say what you're talking about with actually some specifics so it's not the same thing every time but like if you do five words instead of ten I especially lately I've noticed more and more that is just a better way to go about it. But try to actually tell them what the video is about in the thumbnail. Don't just go wow and think anyone's ever gonna. You know how many wow thumbnails people see? So it is an art and it is gonna take trial and error. But that is the best advice that I can give you. So in summary, make every thumbnail you reacting like and make With bikinis uh, in the background. Ooh, yeah, that might work. And then just in big blocky text, right? Is AMD dead? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like so many thumbnails just look like that. So if you do that, it is not going to stick out, actually. But Tom, I do have a question for this one episode, though. Now, can it you and I both do like both, the thumbnail is like me doing the like I'm yelling, <laughs> <laughs> just going crazy. And, it, it, and it, now it, I have a mustache too, so it stick out even more. And, um, it's just uh. Broken silicon, what is this, 230? No, oh, Jesus, 252. I'm way off. We'll do that thing A Street did for a while. Just have like Jesse, my dog in the background with her tongue going like a crazy long length or something for yeah, no and, reason. Yeah, and it will be uh, broken silicon 252. Dan finally tells off. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. 
Another Chris writes and he says, Tom, you've inspired me to keep track of my company's projects to get a better idea of what is going on at my site and across my company. He's not saying which one he works for, but he mm-hmm. says, thank you. Now, another Chris, which I did find that funny. I noticed that Patreon uh, <laughs> on the list because there's like a lot of Chris's in the credits. And so I like that this person named himself another Chris. Uh, mm-hmm. I would say, no, thank you. And I, I do want to end this episode by thanking everybody for the continued support. Uh, despite quite, frankly, a lot of entirely annoying attacks happening on this channel, both both from trolls and also from Sony, which I won't go into detail yet, if you guys didn't miss that happening uh, over the past few weeks. But March was a great month. I wouldn't say April's been bad per se, but it has been a trying month for sure. And yet, you know, seeing a lot of people going to bat for this channel online, it, it, it is not unnoticed or unappreciated. And you know, we've gained more subs, more subscribers to the Patreon every day, even over the past week. And uh, I just want to thank everybody that supports us. Also, there's been a lot of people behind the scenes, uh, like some bigger channels reach out and email me and tell me like, 100%, you you guys don't look like the dicks. They look like the dick. Like Gordon Ung did, reached out to me from PC World and said that. And so and- it is appreciated the people that support us. And uh, we hope to keep supporting you with more independent journalism every week. And I will also add to the end, if you have a lot of Chris's in your name, in a, your Patreon, that suggests we have a lot of people on this podcast that were born between the years of 1970 and 1992. Is that true? Like that's, that's the Chris, that's, that's, that's the christening. The, that's the, that's the christening. <laughs> that's the christening of the American population. 92. So that would be. Yeah, I think our biggest plurality is like, if I'm remembering correctly, it's like between 25 and 45. So, but I think it's the second consistent. one, but I, but in the second tier, it's not actually people below age of 25. It's actually people above the age of 50. So uh, maybe this is all those Chris's. Crap. I mean, that means I think Gen we, need Xers. To, we need to start talking about Fortnite more to get in that Gen Alpha viewership. Is it even Fortnite? Is that, uh, it is, it is still Fortnite. I think isn't it's it? still Fortnite. It's still Unless Fortnite, Fortnite. Gen Alpha listeners. And Roblox. Gen Alpha listeners, I believe you're at most seven years old. But if there's one of you, tell us what game you're playing. I mean, go for it. In man. a non-weird way. Or, or, or they or woman or whatever is going on with the Gen Alpha viewer uh, messaging us about what games they're playing. They just message us like, I play Grand Theft Auto with these like, just swears. It's like, oh, that's not a good sign for this generation. Um, but all right. Again, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for listening. Remember to subscribe to Morris Law's Dead on YouTube. Ring the bell button. Tell people about us. Share it. Comment for the algorithm. Um, and then also subscribe to Broken Silk on your podcast app of choice. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. That actually does help reach people in different ways a lot. And support Moore's Law's Dead on Patreon. Uh, we just had another die shrink come out, uh, answering an eclectic set of questions from everything from how much a can of tuna costs to what we think about the legacy of Meteor Lake and node stagnation coming maybe with like one nanometer. Again, just another was like 40 something minute ad free video out there. If you support us at just $2 a month, which I maintain is kind of a cost of a can of tuna, but this has caused a lot of debate in the Moore's Lizard community. You know, maybe it's like time we do it. Con- tuna. Maybe a it's fancy. time we do it. Next uh, die shrink is just us talking about prices of tuna cans. I mean, there's Star Kiss, there's Chicken of the Sea, others. I, I, I honestly, when you say tuna cans, I can't stop laughing and thinking about it. <laughs> I think, of, you, I should think leave, you should leave. Which <laughs> yeah. I won't go into what they call a tuna can, but I died when I heard the reference. <laughs> so we'll also plug, I think you should leave and figure out which episode they call something a tuna can. <laughs> they call things tuna cans a lot in that show. So, yeah. They but, just decided to. And um, Tim Robinson really needs our help. He's his career is going terribly. That's right. right. He needs our support. He's <laughs> doing very well since he left SNL and created a bunch of his own shows. Um, all right. Well, again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, it's not just me. Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, renders being done by the industrial designer Jean-Philippe Clermont, and special assistance is also provided by Carmen Cry and Kerry Nosugad as well. Find all of our information at www.moreslawisdead.com on the about slash support page 
page in the event you do want to hire me for consulting work, hire Gerard for audio work, hire Jean-Philippe for industrial design work, or you're interested in working with Carbon Cry or Carrie No Sugata as well. You can also find our long-term sponsors on that page if you want to show them some love for putting food on our tables. Or you can also mail us some love. You can send letters or hardware donations to the following address. Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 60632 in Nashville, Tennessee, zip code 37206. Although, to be honest, the best way to show Moore's Law is Dead some love is to support us on Patreon. Patrons are what makes Moore's Law is Dead content truly possible. Every month and really every day, depending on who you're talking about, me, Gerard, Dan, and John philippe are working tirelessly to provide a steady stream of content that we could not keep doing unless we knew the work was possible without being reliant on sponsors dictating every little thing we put out. Don't get us wrong. We love our sponsors, but we love directly working for you, our fans, much more. If you have any extra money, even a couple free dollars a month, consider supporting us directly on Patreon. Those couple of monthly dollars will get you access to the exclusive podcast Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to ask guests questions, and of course, access to the Moore's Laws Dead Discord full of like-minded people who I am sure would love to meet you. I am one of them. Additionally, higher tiers get access to early, ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the ability to ask questions in all Broken Silicon episodes and Loose Ends live streams ahead of the recording, and the entire back catalog of Moore's Law Z podcasts, in addition to having thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts depending on the tier with other perks available as well. And hey... If you cannot afford to support us directly every month, please do share Moore's Law is Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family and on social media and websites like Reddit. And give Broken Silicon a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app of choice. All of this does really help us so much. But like I said, this podcast would not be possible without it. the patrons directly providing predictable and reliable support every month. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher supported levels. Brad Mellon, G Fold, Z Jits, Daniel D, Aaron Close, Jan Renner, Daniel Hyde, GZ Ziggy, Deke, Nicholas Buckner, MJB1, SNES Chalmers, Jim Ferrer, Hardforum.com, Valco Milev, Jensen Wang, Harry S. Acker, Sarcastro, Evan Dingle, Andrew S, Chris Rich, Compressed Earthblocks, 3 ds Boy 08, Hal Buma, Shredberg, Greg Wanchek, Holden Mobley, Benjamin Cannon, Jonathan, Samuel Loss, Blake, Franco Frederick, Jordan Simkovic, Toko, Ian Leak, Jake Do23, The Boss Haas, Jake Martin, Zlicky, Stephen Hart, Mean and Pork, Tim Robb, Ian Clifford, Travis. Travis Gooding, Stefan, Chrysantine, Mad, Zutsu Taylor, Stephen Coates, Michael McGee, Greg, Patty Cakes, Amy Will Chief, Tommy, Mark Mitchell, Anitra Zink, I Should, Mark Raidmaker, James Anderson, Cole Attic, Judson N, Cameron, Wesley Sager, Henry Zhang, Michelle Pell, D31337, Antics, Hexapuma, Reginald Ari, Teak Autumn, Gaiman Since Reagan, Jeff Settler, Loophole 35, Jamie Witters, JSMMH, Windstar, James I, Raider, Corey Leonard, Little Germany, Shea, Milton, Pulse Media, Melodic Warrior, Dave Schultz, Mac Daffy, Stephen Dick, Chuck Glidden, Brett Jones, Austin Haggerty, Justin and bustle i7 11700k joe foot my sharona earth taurus hardland slushball jansen and gima joseph kelly samuel park when weighing him sagung tails 2299 Mel valverga john sisyphos charles russell the forbidden juice rv racer ac brian wright michael cozy dr j mad alex vega freedy john swin jola martina kikum elber gun solarized 80 matthew marlow who 42 penta winter rowan mckicky cornster 671 sprutnik Jeffrey, Gentleman, Angel of Cake, Omega Doge, Roger Webster, Ian, Paul Castro, and of course, thank you to Sahara for the music.